But for today, for today, I want to talk to you about the Trinity, the doctrine of the Trinity. Because here's the thing. Um, the problem is this, is that a lot of times cults and false religions will spend more time thinking about the Trinity than Christians do. So that what happens is we encounter them either at our door or college campus or a family gathering or an event or just you're walking around, you talk to someone about God, and they start challenging on the doctrine of the Trinity and perhaps you're not ready for those attacks. It's usually, in fact, the first place they go. Have you noticed this? I mean, raise your hand if it's happened to you where you're talking to Jehovah's Witness, Mormon, or someone, and the Trinity is the, the thing that comes up. Yeah. Raise your hand if you've never talked to any of those. I'm just kidding, don't. <laughs> don't confess your, your hermitness to us all. But... Um, <laughs> But Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, Islam, um, the, the Mother God group that's right now on our college campuses, Unitarian groups, the list goes on and on. Um, they often will hit you with questions. So I'm going to give you this. Here's, here's our outline for today. I'm going to give you seven questions that they might ask you that might be really hard to explain or answer if you don't understand the Trinity. Then I'm going to explain to you the Trinity from Scripture. Then we're going to answer those questions. So I'm going to bother you at first, but then I'm going to fix the problem. So it's kind of like the physician, he like cuts into you, he creates a bigger problem to fix another problem. Yeah, I'm going to do that just a little bit. <laughs> so, I'm gonna, so here I'm like, I've, I've washed and sanitized, I'm going to slice you open slightly here with these questions. So let's, let's say you're, you're talking with a friend, a neighbor, you want to bring them to Christ, you want to show them to put their faith and trust in Jesus. So the topic of who Jesus is comes up, because right, if you don't believe in the, the actual Jesus, something's wrong. But it's got to be the right Jesus. It can't just be anyone named Jesus I believe in. I mean, that could be like the guy I went to school with, right? His name was Jesus, right? We all went to school with someone named Jesus, most likely around here. So, question number one, they ask you. They say, why isn't the word Trinity found in the Bible? And you go, hmm, I, I didn't realize it wasn't found in the Bible. I guess it's not, now that I think about it, huh? And they say, well, that's because it's not biblical, because the doctrine of the Trinity is not biblical. And I thought you were a Bible-believing Christian. Why do you believe something that's not in the Bible? Question number two. Jesus said the Father was the only true God. John 17, 3. Jesus himself, he says, this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. If, if the Father is the only true God, then how can Jesus be God? That doesn't make any sense. He can't be. Question number three. Obviously, Jesus isn't God because he said, my Father is greater than I. John 14, 28, right? Jesus says it himself, and, and I guarantee you they will take you to this, this verse. How many of you have had them take you to this passage, right? This is the passage they go, John 14, 28, and they read it. You have heard me say to you, I'm going away and coming back to you. If you loved me, you'd rejoice because I said I'm going to the Father, for my Father is greater than I. How can God be greater than God? Well, then Jesus must not be God. This is, this is what the cult or false religious group or Unitarian group is going to say. Question number four. Jesus prayed to the Father, right? He prayed to God. Well, how could God pray to God? That doesn't make sense. God can't pray to God. That doesn't make any sense. Question number five, how can Jesus be God if he's God's son? You're, you're not your dad, right? I, I have a dad. Actually, my dad's name is also Mike Winger. That makes things slightly awkward. In the age of social media, when he gets invited to parties I'm supposed to go to. <laughs> You know, but, but I'm not him. I, I would say, guys, I'm not him. He's my dad, but I'm not my dad. So Jesus can't be God because he's not his father. Question number six, but Colossians, Colossians says that Jesus is the first creation of God. Colossians 1.15, it says he's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. So he was the first one made. That's what it means, right? He was the first created being. In fact, in a recent poll done by, uh, I think it was Ligonier Ministries who did this, R.C. Sproul's ministry, Sproul, I always say his name wrong. Jesus, here's the question that was asked of Americans, I think about 3,000 were polled, and they were asked, uh, evangelicals, those who identified as evangelicals, they said that Jesus was the first and greatest being created by God the Father. 78% said yes. Well, then I guess you're a Jehovah's Witness because that's not what we believe. But that's the verse they'll go to, Colossians 1.15. And finally, the last question is this, why didn't Jesus just come out and say, I'm God? Could have solved this whole problem for you if he would have just said, I'm God. But he never said it, because you have an unbiblical doctrine you call the Trinity that was developed by Constantine when he, when he took over the church and he forced his Roman beliefs upon them and he changed the, and then they make a bunch of historical conspiracy theories that aren't actually true. So, 
that, has that ever happened to you? Has this, has this experience, okay, now let's fix the problem. Because here's the thing, they've thought more about the Trinity than you have. And that's okay to admit it at that point and say, the problem isn't the doctrine of the Trinity, the problem isn't the faith of Christians, it's perhaps my, uh, my ignorance as to some of these issues. But uh, now that I've cut you open, I'm going to fix the problem. <laughs> so let's establish the doctrine of the Trinity, then we'll answer those questions because they can all be answered. Most of them are just misconceptions. So the first anchor or the first important truth we have to have as Christians related to the doctrine of the Trinity is that we believe there is how many gods? easy. You guys already score an A. <laughs> you know, you're already good. There's one God, right? We call this monotheism. Mono means one. Theism is belief in God. We believe in one God. There's only one God. No matter what you say about who Jesus is, there's still only one God. That's the first foundational truth. Now, this generally is not a problem for people. For the most, now some people it is, but for most people, I don't have to talk to them about monotheism. I don't have to convince them of monotheism. They're already on the same page generally speaking. But there's a couple scriptures I'll share with you. So Isaiah 43, 10, let's, and I do encourage you to either go to or write these down in your notes so you could, because one day you're going to take the bullet and you've got, and you're going to be like, I'm going to pull that out and share that with this person at my door or, or this friend or this family member, so it might be useful for you to write these down. So Isaiah 43, 10, Isaiah, the, 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 the 40s of Isaiah, when Isaiah was in his 40s, he got really into monotheism. <laughs> so in the 40s, you know, 40 several chapters that are in the 40s of Isaiah, um, he's dealing strongly with monotheism, proclaiming that God's the only God. Well, this is one of those verses, Isaiah 43, 10. He says, you are my witnesses, says the Lord, says Yahweh, and my servant whom I've chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me, there was no God formed, nor shall there be after me. This is pretty clear, right? Like it was before me? Nope, there was no God before me. There will be no God after me. That pretty much encompasses all of everything. There's only one God. Isaiah 44, one chapter down, Isaiah 44, verse 6, it says, Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. And who can proclaim as I do? Then let him declare it and set it in order before me, since I appointed the ancient people and the things that are coming and shall come. Let them show these to them. The idea here is God saying, I can tell the future, and these other false religions and false gods, they can't predict the future because they don't exist. So God's kind of showing his pedigree with prophecy. Prophecy is like God's fingerprint on the scriptures. Like, see, only God can do that. Pro proclaim the future before it happens. Then in verse 8, he says, do not fear nor be afraid. Have I not told you from that time and declared it? You are my witnesses. Is there a God besides me? Indeed, there is no other rock. I know not one. Well, let's see. If God doesn't know about any other gods, what does that imply? <laughs> right? That implies there are no other gods. This is pretty clear. He's trying to make it very, very clear. I'll give you one more verse for this. Isaiah 45, um, verses 21 and 22. He says, tell and bring forth your case. Yes, let them take counsel together. The them here is the false gods and the, those who believe in false gods. Who declared this from ancient time? Who has told it from that time? Have not I the Lord? And so he's speaking again of prophecy as his, the, the way he proves who he is. And there is no other God besides me, a just God and a savior. There is none besides me. Look to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth. For I am God and there is no other. Now, the foundational fact of, of the Trinity, of the doctrine of the Trinity, of what we believe as Christians, is monotheism. If your view of the Trinity is that the Father is one God, that Jesus is another God, the Spirit is another God, that's not the doctrine of the Trinity, right? That's polytheism, many gods. That's an entirely different pagan thing. That's not Christianity, right? Because Christianity comes from this Old Testament truths that we, that we start with. It's anchored upon the Old Testament and built upon it, right? So we, we have monotheism. So what then is the doctrine of the Trinity? Well, it's basically not, it's not three gods in one God, but rather it is one God who exists forever with three persons that are equal. One God, three persons. This is why the Trinity is not one plus one plus one equals three, as though I take one apple, another apple, another apple, and then I get one apple somehow. No, because the three are persons, and the one is a, is a being or a God. 
right? The God. So we have one being, three persons, right? You, you're, you're one person and one being, but your personhood and your being are not the same identical thing. So a being, I'm a human being. That's kind of what I am. You know, this, this paper is a, has a, a quality of being or existence. It exists with certain qualities. Um, but yet within God, there is these three persons. That's what the Trinity is. In fact, tri- Trinity means tri, which means three, right? Like tricycle or like try, try again. I'm just seeing if you're paying attention. Try, <laughs> it's like three, try, and then unity or unity, try, unity, three and one. That's the idea. We have three persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But there's only one God. Jesus is God. The Holy Spirit is God. The Father is God. But they're not three different. No, no, they're the same God. That's the the basic doctrine of the Trinity in a nutshell. So the what, the the one, there's one what and three who's. I'm saying this again because I feel like we got to just drill it in, right? There's one what of the Trinity and three who's. The what is the essence or being of God. There's one God. The three who's are the three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but they share in the same being. And you're like, wow. So you're saying God's like, God's like not like us. Surprise. (laughs) So you're saying God's not like, what do I compare him to? So like my analogy is about like, say, water, ice, and steam. No, that's modalism. That's called, a, that's called a heresy. That's not quite right. You know, it might help you a little bit, but it's not actually accurate when you push on that analogy. Because it's not like the Father becomes the Son, who becomes the Holy Spirit, just like water, which becomes ice, becomes steam. No, that doesn't quite work. It's not like the egg, where you have the shell and the white and the yolk, yolk, however I'm supposed to say that word. <laughs> I suddenly realized I don't know how to pronounce that word. But it's not like that because it's not like Jesus is the shell because he's like God with skin. No, no, no. But if you say he's the shell, you're just saying he's the skin. Like, we're not saying each is one-third God. No, their personhoods are not the same as their being. So there's one God, three persons. But God makes it clear. He says, there's nothing to compare me to. To what in creation will you compare me? There's nothing. So I say as Christians, give up on analogies when it comes to describing the Trinity because you're trying to compare God to creation when God says, you can't. So, of course, you're going to, you know, fall short in doing that. I had a friend who thought he was finally convinced in the Trinity because he looked at the, 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 uh, the constellation Orion's belt. And it has three stars, yet it's one constellation. And I was like, I'm glad that helps you, but that's not the Trinity, right? Because it's not like we have th- the three different beings sort of smashed together to make one God. And we have three persons, one being. So Orion doesn't really work for us. There is a solution, though. You want to know the Trinity, you want to believe the Trinity. Rather than going to analogies, I recommend going to something slightly better. Scripture. Like to just let the Bible tell us. Because if God says, hey, here's my writings, these will tell you who I am, we're just simply called to trust him in what he says about himself. So let's dig into that. What's the scriptural support for this? Um, Well, I find that in my conversations with people, when it comes to the Father being God, I rarely have to argue about that, right? In fact, I can't think of any time someone's been like, well, the Father's not God. No, no, they're all, they always say the same thing. They say, Jesus isn't God. Or they'll say the Holy Spirit isn't God. It's a, it's a force, a non-personal energy type force, like, ooh, like Star Wars, or I don't know, this is like a squid. I didn't mean to be a squid. I meant to be like, like these are not the droids you're looking for. Like, that's the Holy Spirit, you know, that's, that's what's going on. No, um, Okay, so the Father's not really the debate area. So I'll just give you a, a couple of quick thoughts on that. We'll move over to the Son, where the major debate happens on the doctrine of the Trinity. In 1 Peter 1, 2, we have this phrase, God the Father. I don't know how else to interpret that, other than to say that God, that the Father is God. That seems pretty clear. Um, there's lots of, actually, you could do a Google search on God the Father and just look up 100 verses that, that give you this, this statement over and over again. I think we're we're pretty much past that for the most part in our culture. But in Matthew 3.16, we get some clarity. Matthew 3.16 and 17. And this I'd like to read to you. Because while the Father is God, the Father is not the Son, and the Father is not the Holy Spirit. You see, now we have to remember the difference between persons and being. The Father, he's God, that's the being. But he's not the Holy Spirit, that's a person. He's not the Son, that's a person. The Son is God, but he's not the Father. That's a person of the same being, but they're different persons. That's the doctrine. Matthew 3.16, it tells us this. It says, when he had been baptized, 
Jesus, at Jesus' baptism, came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw, he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven, saying, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. You know who can make sense of this passage? Trinitarians, right? Those who believe in the doctrine of the Trinity. Because we don't think God was doing ventriloquism, right? He's like, the Son is God, and he's like talking, and the Father is God, and the Holy Spirit, and they're all, the three persons are doing different things, but they're all God. That's how we understand this. So most will agree, though, that the Father is God. So let's move on to the controversial stuff. And I know some of you might be like, Mike, this isn't controversial. Of course Jesus is God. And all I can say is, um, you know, just try to have more conversations about the Lord. Try to have more conversations with even your family and friends about this topic, about the Trinity, about who Jesus is, and see if they're not, some of them are not confused about it, because they probably are. So Colossians 2, verse 8 we're going to go through a bunch of them now. So hopefully you'll, you'll be with me. Um, you may want to underline these in your Bibles. Write them upon your foreheads. Keep them as frontlets before your eyes. Colossians 2, verses 8 and 9. It says, Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. So the, the first thing is it's a warning that someone would lead you away from the truth of Christ. And then it explains what the truth of Christ is. For in him, in Christ, right, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Could it be more clear? Jesus isn't a third God. No, all the fullness of the Godhead dwells in him bodily. Now that word for Godhead actually um, is the word meaning divine essence. And this is like a bunch of Greek information that supports this, but basically the word itself means the divine essence or the divine being. He is truly God. Like, he's, he fully partakes in being deity. Not partially, not a third of God, not something like that. It's the fullness of the Godhead that dwells in him bodily. So he's, he's some people put it this way. They say Jesus is 100% God and 100% man. That doesn't make total sense to me, um, because now, so he's 200%. So that's a little confusing, right? But the Bible doesn't use that terminology. So what a lot of smart dead people have said about Jesus, <laughs> from who we can learn from our, uh, our earlier uh, Christian sources, they've put it this way. They've said, Jesus is truly God and truly man. And that's like a simple way to put it that's very defensible from the scripture. He really is God and he really is human. He's really both of those things. Now he was always God and he took on human form. So that human thing was an addition, but he, he continued to be God. So while he was even walking the earth, all the fullness of the, of the deity or of, of the divine essence was dwelling in him bodily. Another verse is Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Man, I love this passage. Okay, so Acts 20, as you're on your way there, I'll tell you about the context. Pages, nobody's flipping pages out here? Bible study in, Bible study, Bible read your Bible. Okay, Acts 20, 28. This passage is where Paul the Apostle is um, uh, giving the Ephesian elders, the elders in Ephesus, like his farewell address. He won't see them anymore. So he gives them like his, his final command to these, these shepherds for the people of God, these pastors, these leaders. And in Acts 20, 28, look what he says to them. He says, therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. <coughs> Pardon me. To shepherd the church of God, which who purchased with whose blood? But doesn't it say that God purchased the church with God's blood? Yes, it does. Because Jesus is God. That's the teaching of the early church. Jesus is, in fact, God. There's a couple other verses that are really strong for this. Um, actually, quite a few verses, but here's a couple. Um, Titus 2.13. Titus chapter 2.13, another one of the Pauline epistles, so you can kind of keep flipping forward from where you are, and all of Paul's epistles are collected together in your New Testament after the book of Acts. Um, one of the pastoral epistles, he wrote it to young church leaders. 
So Titus 2.13, um, and I'll tell you this, this verse has gotten much stronger over the years. It's actually, it used to be used to say that Jesus is God, that is the deity of Christ, but this verse actually got a lot stronger when, when we discovered something in Greek called the Granville Sharp Rule. And the, you know, it's not too often where in language you find rules that are really consistent. Like any of you who learned English as a second language, you probably began to be offended at how often we break all of our own rules. You're like, well, then how does it work? You know, and I remember learning Greek, and w- which I did not learn very well, I'll fully admit, right? But when I stu- was studying Greek, um, it, was, it, was, uh, it was difficult to learn it because sometimes it just breaks its own rules. So you're learning these rules, and they go, oh, yeah, that's an exception. That's an exception. That's an exception. I before E, except half of the time, right? <laughs> I guess it just doesn't work for us super well when we do that. But the Granville Sharp rule is a very specific rule that's actually super consistent, and that made this stronger about the deity of Jesus. So without getting into all the details, just know that what I'm saying is supported by a lot of Greek scholarship, which is kind of fun. Titus 2.13, it says, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, is this saying that there's our great God and our Savior? No, 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 no. This is, there's a blessed hope and glorious appearing of who? Of our great God, who is also what? Our Savior, who is who? Jesus Christ. Now, the Granville Sharps rule, what it says is it tells us that for sure the phrase God is referring to Jesus as well as Savior. So it's, it's just bolstering that even stronger. There's another place where this happens, and that's in 2 Peter 1.1. 1, 1. 2 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, and it's the same Granville Sharps construction. It's the same rule that supports this view. So the first chapter of the first and the first verse of 2 Peter says, <clears throat> Simon Peter, a bond servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who obtain, obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of God, of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. The righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He is our God and our Savior. It's very clear in the text. And this, of course, is supported by the Greek. Now, the Jehovah's Witnesses, their New World Translation, they don't translate it that way. They violate the Granville Sharps rule. They just, because you can't, because that destroys their doctrine, which is why they need their own translation, the New World Translation. So if you ever see a New World Translation, know that that was deliberately made, I mean, in all honesty, it was deliberately made to hide the deity of Jesus, to change the text. So the funny thing is that they follow the Granville Sharps rule everywhere else in the Bible, but here in these two verses I gave you, that's where they violate it. Why would they follow it everywhere and violate it here? Because it's not their teaching. Because they're changing the Bible in order to fit their teachings. It's very sad because many of their members don't know any of this. They think they have the most faithful translation you could have. They think your translations are all messed up. Um, I, I don't think a hundred translations are messed up and this one got it right. <laughs> it's probably the other way around. So let's give you another verse, because some people say, well, why didn't Jesus come out and just say, I am God? But they don't realize how strongly he did say it. So turn, please, to John chapter 8. This is going to be, I hope, fun for you, as it is for me. John chapter 8. In John 8, Jesus is having a a long discussion through this passage um, with a group of Jewish people Um, talking about his identity. That's the discussion is, will they really believe in him? And get this, Jesus doesn't just want them to believe that he, that he's good or that he's helpful or that he's a savior. Who is it that Jesus is trying to tell them to believe he is? Jesus is saying, it seems to me, he's saying, believe that I am God, right? The God, the same God who speaks in the Old Testament, that's me standing here right before you. So in John 8, 58, Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, Before Abraham was, I am. Now, those of you who um, did better in English than I did when you were in school, you'll immediately notice that something's wrong with the grammar. Before Abraham was, I was Jesus. Don't you mean to say I was? Before Abraham was, I was. It's past tense. But he says before Abraham was, I am. Why does he do this? Well, for a couple reasons. For one, Jesus is trying to say that he's eternally existent. It's speaking of his eternality. He, is, he comes into time, right, to, to reach us, but he is outside of time, the creator of all things. 
So he's eternal. But there's another thing here, and some of you know the Greek, many of you do, right? What is, he, what is the Greek when he says, I am? Ego a me, right? Let go my ego. <laughs> ego is, is, is I, and a me is the verb for existence. He goes, I, I am, I simply exist. Turn now, keep your hand there in John 8. We're going to come right back to it, but turn, if you would, please, to Isaiah 43, verse 10. Isaiah 43, 10. Remember this passage where um, God is trying to make it clear to them that there's no other gods, that he's the only God? Let's read it again, and know this, that the Jewish audience Jesus is speaking to in John 8, they know this passage. They know very well this passage. And Isaiah 43, 10 says, You are my witnesses, says the Lord, and my servant whom I've chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. In the Greek translation of Isaiah, the Greek translation of Isaiah, that the New Testament authors had access to and were reading, do you know what it says there? It says that you may know that ego a me, I am. That's what it says in the Greek. Jesus says you have to believe that I am. He says, before Abraham was, I am. And then he says, before me, there was no God formed, nor shall there be after me. So he speaks of before me, pff, no, I just am. There's no before me, there's none after me. And then Jesus says, I am. Now turn back to John chapter 8, and we'll look at verse 24, and keep that Isaiah passage in mind, where God says that they have to know and believe him, and believe that he is I am. And in John 8, 24, it says, Therefore, I said to you, Jesus speaking here, you will die in your sins, for if you do not believe that I am, and the he is added with italics there because it's ego a me, you will die in your sins. Know and believe that I am? That's, that's what you have to do. You have to believe that he is the I am. That's what Isaiah 43.10 says, that you have to know and believe and understand that God is I am. And Jesus comes and he says, yeah, I am. Did Jesus claim to be God? Well, in case you think this was my misunderstanding, in the very next verse after Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am, this is what happens in John 8.59. Look at how the audience reacts, because they know what he's doing. Then they took up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple going through the midst of them and so passed by. They were going to try to kill him on the spot, not like a courtroom hearing death penalty. No, no, no. Mob attack. Because the statements he was making were either the most amazing truth of all reality, that God is in our midst, or total blasphemy. This man is claiming to be God. They understood it. So did Jesus say he was God? Well, yes, he did. In um, another passage where Jesus is also speaking, in Revelation 22, that should be easy to find. It's right before the back cover of your Bible. <laughs> Last chapter in the book of Revelation. Revelation 22. Jesus himself is speaking in verses 12 and 13, and look at what he says about who he is. It says, And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give every, to everyone according to his work. So Jesus is coming. That's kind of the theme in Revelation, right? Is the return of Christ, the second coming. And then in verse 13, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. He claims to be the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Well, if you, might, if you, if you mind going back to Isaiah, back to Isaiah 41, we can get more clarity on what this means. Alpha and Omega, by the way, is a Greek, it's Greek letters. It's like saying I'm in the A and the Z. He's the beginning and the end. So he's, he's the start and the finish of all things. Um, that doesn't mean that he began to exist, because then you're going to say he ceases to exist when he becomes the end. <laughs> the beginning and the end, so Jesus is temporary? No, that's certainly not what he's saying. What he's saying is what God said in Isaiah uh, 41, verse 4, he says, who has performed and done it, calling the generations from the beginning, speaking again of prophecy, I, the Lord, Yahweh, that's, that's like Jehovah, that, that's God's name, when you see the capital L-O-R-D, I am the first, and with the last, I am he. And then Jesus, in Revelation 22, verse 13, he takes those words from Isaiah and he applies them to himself. The words of who? Yahweh. Jesus is claiming he's Yahweh. 
See, I'm saying the Father is Yahweh. The Son is Yahweh. The Spirit is Yahweh. There is one Yahweh. There's one God. There are three persons. That's the teaching of the, of the, of the Scriptures. Let's go to another passage, John 20, 28. I, I hope this excites you. I hope it blesses you, and I hope that you find something here that you can share with somebody else, especially because um, for too long, maybe, we've been a little unequipped to handle these issues, and we're supposed to be the light of the world. If there's one issue you want to be able to explain to people, it's who Jesus is, right? So John 20, 28, <clears throat> Jesus is appearing after his death to Thomas. We call him Doubting Thomas. Um, I don't usually use that term, but uh, there was a time when he doubted, but he didn't experience what the others saw. Um, anyway, sometimes we beat up on poor Thomas a little bit too much, I think. But, <laughs> but in John 20, 28, um, Jesus appears to Thomas, and he's like, look, feel the imprint of the nails, meaning it was the same body that had died and, and risen again, and it was, it, this was Jesus alive from the dead. When Thomas sees Christ alive from the dead, look at what he says. He says, <clears throat> and Thomas answered and said to him, John 20, 28, my Lord and my God. Now, some people are very fanciful in how they reinterpret this verse. They're like, well, Thomas, he looked at Jesus, and he said, my Lord. And then he looked up, and he went, my God. <laughs> They're trying really hard. Like, what is, what is that Shakespearean phrase? Like, methinks thou dost protest too much, or something like that. I don't know how. I think you're working too hard to get past what it clearly says. Thomas is very clearly saying that Jesus is both his Lord and his God. In fact, this is the consistent teaching that we get is that he's Lord and God. Now, um, when people bow down in the Bible to worship someone other than God, how do those beings usually react? Well, Peter, he, he was like, stop it, don't worship us, right? The angel in Revelation, John bowed to worship the angel because he was so glorious, and John was just, you know, just so impressed and so, like, maybe flustered for what he was seeing, so he bows to worship this angel, and the angel says, stop that, don't do that. Worship God. All worship belongs to God. Yet here he's bowing before Jesus. He's calling him Lord and God. When Jesus gets worshiped in the scriptures, in the gospels, he receives the worship. When the apostles get it, they stop it and they say, stop, no, 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 you're confused. Worship God. Why? Because to worship Jesus is to worship God. Okay, one of my favorite passages for the Trinity is John chapter 1, if we could go there. I love John 1. Um, this verse is so clear that it, it, like others, has to be retranslated by the Jehovah's Witnesses um, in their New World translation. They change it, uh, and they do it without justification. One day I'll do a whole long teaching on all the Greek and stuff on that, um, but that'll be online. And not on a Sunday morning in Hosanna, but, but you can follow me, Mike Winger. Check out my Facebook page and my YouTube and Twitter. Um, <laughs> so John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, it says, <clears throat> In the beginning... In the beginning was the word. Now this, this kind of harkens back to Genesis 1. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. So here's like a, a more information about creation passage, John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. We have the Trinity in one verse right there. At least the concepts of the Trinity. So in the beginning was the word, Okay, so he's in the beginning. He's, he's already there at the beginning of creation before creation begins. He's already there. He's with God, so there's like this relationship quality that, that's going on. He's in relationship with God. I mean, how could God love anyone before creation happens? I've actually heard people say this, that the reason why God made us was because he wanted someone to love or because God was lonely, because he was all alone. God's never been alone. Because God is three persons in one God. So the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, they've always had fellowship with each other. The Word was with God. So there's this relationship thing going on for eternity in God. That's why we can say that God is love. Because how can God be love when he has no one to love? Like you can't isolate yourself on an island, never talk to anybody for 30 years, and then call yourself love. I am love. How? Well, I don't do any harm to anyone. Like, that's not what love is. <laughs> right? Lo love is, love involves actually interacting with people, you know, and not harming them, not just avoiding them entirely. That's not love. So God is love. So the word was with God. The word was God means he's eternal. The word was with God means he's in relationship with God. So that's the three persons. And then the word was God, that's the one being. The with God is the persons. The, the was God is the being, who God is. 
You see, the balance of the Trinity is forced on us. I believe the Trinity because I have to, because the Scripture makes me believe it. It tells me there's one God, and then it tells me the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are different persons. So I, I believe it because I believe the Bible. That's why I believe in the doctrine of the Trinity. Um, I was going to share with you this really awesome, amazing, insightful stuff. The most insightful thing you ever would have heard, probably, um, from John 12 and Isaiah. But, um, you know, I don't have enough time, so we'll move on. So, <laughs> it may as well mess, mess with you if I'm not going to tell you. Okay, so. Um, Jesus is God. Is it not clearly taught in the Bible, both from the, the lips of Jesus and the apostles, in the book of Acts, in the epistles, in the book of Revelation, in the Gospels, Jesus is God? Yes, very, very clear. Um, but he's not the Father, and that's an important fact. Jesus is not the Father, right? The Father, the Son, the Spirit, these are three different persons, and they do different things. There's some ways in which they're different. So we have the fact that the Son, he came in human form, not the Father, not the Holy Spirit. The Son died for our sins and was raised to life again, not the Father. The Father sends the Son. The, one, the Son is the one who goes. The son, the son, after he ascends, gives us the Holy Spirit. But it's not like he's moving in modes. It's not like the Father was active in the Old Testament. Then in the New Testament, Jesus is active. And then at the end of that, then he turns into the Holy Spirit. That's called modalism, or God's like shifting and changing from one to another. But that denies the three persons of God. God's just like wearing different hats. That's like saying, hey, I'm a, I'm, I'm a, I'm a, a, a husband, and I'm a father, and I'm a grandson. Yeah, but I'm only one person, so that doesn't work. No, there are actually three different persons in the Trinity. So we don't use that. That's why, again, we don't use that analogy because it ends up falling short of what Scripture teaches. Think about this, though, for a second. Jesus is God. Okay, that's the doctrine of it. That's like the math of the thing. And he came in human form, lived in, in basically poverty, lived a sinless life, tolerated our presence, which we have a hard time tolerating, and we're not even holy, lived in and amongst us in the filth, the spiritual filth of humanity, died for our sins, took my sin upon him. This was God taking my sin upon him on the cross. No wonder his life could pay for the lives of all of us. It's God who went to the cross. If I think about this, I'm like, that means the words of Jesus are the words of God. That means that to reject Jesus is to reject God. That means that to receive Jesus is to receive God and to know God and to be forgiven by God. That means to be given the righteousness of Jesus is to be given the righteousness of God. And then that's when your theology goes, you know, and your, your mind explodes and you're like, can we do more worship songs now? <laughs> you know, we want to, I want to praise the Lord for his goodness and his kindness. He entered into creation. He became a human. He suffered humbly for me all that I might know him. He's reached out so entirely to me. Okay, I want to talk about for a minute about the third person of the Trinity, at least in the order we usually say, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and that's the Holy Spirit. So it's actually not that hard in Scripture to, uh, to show that the Holy Spirit is God. I won't spend as much time on this because, again, this isn't generally debated. Um, it is with Jehovah's Witnesses. They think the Holy Spirit is an active force, like an energy that just kind of comes upon you or something. Now, I may feel the Holy Spirit, but that doesn't mean the Holy Spirit is a feeling. Sometimes I feel love for my wife. Doesn't mean that she's the feeling I'm having. No, the Holy Spirit is God um, and one of the persons of the Trinity. So Acts chapter 5, if you would please turn there. Acts chapter 5 has an interesting story about these, this couple, Ananias and Sapphira. Um, they basically lied to the church about how much money they were giving. They were pretended to give more than they were, and so they were being hypocrites. And it was the first instance of hypocrisy in the early church and um, God wanted to, it, it, it shows you how he really feels about hypocrites in the church. Um, uh, fix it. <laughs> if that's going on, fix it. Get your eyes on Jesus. Live your life right. But uh, in Acts chapter 5, verse 3, this is the response after they lied to the church. It says, but, but Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? So who did he lie to? the Holy Spirit, and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself. While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? 
why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. When you lied to the Holy Spirit, you lied to God. They're just interchangeable terms. Then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last, so great fear came upon all those who heard these things. Because God is, we, we often talk about how gracious God is, but grace doesn't mean anything unless God's actually withholding judgment, which would mean that I actually deserve something. So there's a sense of humility. When you say God is gracious, you're not like, because I'm worthy, because that's the contradiction. <laughs> He's gracious because I'm not. He's gracious because of what I deserve. Um, but so the, the idea that the Holy Spirit is God, that's not that hard to get across to people. That's clearly taught. But is the Holy Spirit a person? Or is he just like, is he really an it? Is he really an it? That would be the question. But Acts 13, 2, if you would turn there, you're already in, conveniently in Acts because of my careful planning. <laughs> so Acts 13, 2, it says, as they, um, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Now, does an active force speak in the first person? No. I mean, if the Holy Spirit is just like an energy force or something, then he's not going to be like, now do this for me because I have said for you to do it. Like, that's not an active force. Right? This is a person talking. There's a personhood in the Holy Spirit. If you would turn to Acts chapter 10, verse 19 and 20. Acts 10, 19, and 20. Only three chapters back due to careful and methodical planning. (laughs) And it says, While Peter thought about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are seeking you. Now, did you catch who's speaking? The Spirit said to him. The Spirit is speaking to him. Arise, therefore, go down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. There's a person who sent them, and the person is the Spirit. So we're we're seeing the personhood. I could go on and on, actually. The Holy Spirit, there's scripture that says the Holy Spirit guides us. I mean, forces don't guide me, right? The Holy Spirit guides us. The Holy Spirit testifies of the Son. The Holy Spirit speaks to us. He discloses or ex- explains truth to us. He glorifies the Son. Um, 2 Corinthians 2.11, it says that the Holy Spirit knows the thoughts of God. Does electricity know anything? No. Does, does an active force know anything? No, certainly not. But the Holy Spirit, according to 2 Corinthians 2.11, knows the thoughts of God. So, therefore, the Holy Spirit is a person. Um, according to Scripture, Matthew 3.29, the Holy Spirit can be blasphemed. You can blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Um, he can be grieved, Ephesians 4.30. You could grieve the Holy Spirit. Energy forces aren't like, oh, you know, they don't feel grieved. They don't feel grief and sorrow, but you can actually cause the Holy Spirit sorrow, so there's a personhood that's there. He can be insulted, Hebrews 10.29. I've never insulted electricity. You know, I'm, not that I'm aware of. You, you know, you, you, if chi was a real thing, I don't know if you could insult it or make it feel bad. No, there's a personhood in the Holy Spirit. That's the idea with Scripture there. So the Holy Spirit is, per, is a person, but I would say the Holy Spirit is not the Father or the Son. This protects us, and we realize this, right? Three persons, the Father's not the Son, the Son's not the Spirit, the Spirit's not the Father, right? But they're God, each equally God, the one being. 1 Peter 1, 2, it says that we are elect according to the foreknowledge of the Father in sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. So it gives us the three persons and their different activities. We're elect, elect by the Father. He's chosen us. We've been um, sanctif- we're being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. He's working in our lives to make us more like Christ. But we've been washed by the blood of Jesus. So we see the three persons of the Trinity doing different things in our lives. That's interesting, isn't it? So we have the doctrine of the Trinity is forced upon me. It's forced upon me from Scripture. Uh, one more verse I'll give you is Matthew 28, 19. This is actually a really famous Trinitarian verse. And you may not notice it when you first read it, but it's really neat what's there. Matthew 28, 19. He says, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name, not names, name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now, if I was to baptize you in the name of, and then I named three different persons, you'd expect three names. How can I baptize you in one name when I'm listing three persons? Because the three persons are one being, God. So if you're baptized in the name of God, 
You're baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. What the New Testament's doing is it's, it's, it's giving us greater revelation of who God is, showing you this like three persons within one being so that God could be love. Um, in conclusion, I guess, before I answer those questions that I bothered you with in the beginning, we'll go through those in just a second. I want to say this. The Trinity is not the problem. It's the solution to the problem of what all these scriptures are saying about God. That's what the Trinity is. It's the solution. We're forced to believe it if you believe the whole Bible. This is why so often cult groups will jump away from verses to new verses because they're going to only take half of the verses about God and use them to fight against the other half. Whereas Christians throughout the centuries, what we've done is we've taken all of them and believed all of them. That's what we do. We believe all of them. So we don't believe modalism. The Father becomes the Son, becomes the Spirit. We don't believe that. We don't believe tritheism or that there's three gods. That's Mormonism that the Father, Son, and Spirit are actually three different gods. No, we believe in one God existing in three persons, co-equal, co-eternal. All right, let's do the questions, the seven questions. Are you ready for this? As I ask these questions like I did in the beginning, I'm hoping that you can anticipate the answers and think of them in your head, that you've already are equipped now to answer the questions so when you deal with a skeptic or someone who's lost in their sin and doesn't know who Jesus is, that you'll be able to have good answers. Question one, why isn't the word Trinity found in the Bible? Why isn't the word Trinity found in the Bible? Because the Trinity is the name of a doctrine that is taught in the Bible. I like to ask him this. I say, do you believe that God is omnipresent? And they go, yes. And I'll say, well, why isn't the word omnipresent found in the Bible? Oh, well, but, well, no, but the teaching that God's omnipresent, that's found in the Bible. You know what the word the Bible uses to, to describe the Trinity? God. Because it says God and it describes him as three in one. So we have the doctrine of the Trinity in the Bible. Um, the term itself, Trinity, triunity, is a summary of the teaching that we find in the scriptures. So it's not relevant. And they believe God's omnipresent. They believe God's omniscient. Do you believe God's omniscient? Yes, I do. Okay, well, that word's not in the Bible either. So, <laughs> but the teaching that God knows all things, that's in the scripture. We just have a word for it. Number two, question number two. Jesus said the Father was the only true God. From John 17, 3, I'll read this verse again. And this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Is the Father the only true God? Yes. Is the Son the only true God? Yes. Is the Holy Spirit the only true God? How can I say that? Because there's only one true God. With three per- so what that verse does is it kills the idea that Jesus is a different God. It says, no, there's only one God. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. So the Father is that one true God, but it's not exclusive. It doesn't mean the Son is not or the Spirit is not. <clears throat> Question number three. Obviously Jesus isn't God because he said his Father was greater than him. This is from John 14, 28. He said, I'm going to the Father for my Father is greater than I. Now, what he doesn't say is, I'm going to God because God is better than me. He says, I'm going to the Father, so it's speaking of the difference in the persons, not the difference in some sort of being. The Father's greater than I. Well, this is person-specific. It's about the Father being greater. Well, in what sense was the Father greater? Well, the Son, he laid aside his glory, and he came and took on human form. The Father didn't do that, so the Father's greater in a sense of like role at the time of Christ walking the earth. He humbled himself. This, look at what Philippians says. It makes it very clear that this is a temporary situation. The whole the Father is greater. It's because Christ came in the flesh. That's how the Father is greater. Philippians 2.6, it says this, Who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. So Jesus is in God's form and he's equal with God. Okay, that's the doctrine of the Trinity. He's the same being. But made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. So he's truly God, truly man. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. Jesus says, this is why it's good for me to go to the Father. It's about his exaltation. He came temporarily humbled, and he gets exalted back to his original position. So you see, the Father's greater than me. It's not a statement about like him not being God. It's a statement about the Father was greater because Jesus was humbled, and he would in the future be exalted, and it was that thing he was looking forward to. As he says in John 17, 5, Oh, now, Father, glorify me together with yourself 
with the glory which I had with you before the world was. So he's being exalted. So that's why Jesus says, my father is greater than I. Um, so I would recommend if people take you to that verse in John 14, 28, you take them to John 17, 5, take them to Philippians 2, verses 6 through 11. Question number four, was God praying to God? No, the son was praying to the father because they confused the difference between the being and the persons. The son's praying to the father. Three persons means that there can be relationship. Because there's three persons in God, God has relationship, which means that Jesus coming in human form can pray to the Father. And so we have God in relationship with himself. Without this, I don't know, again, I don't know how God is love without the Trinity. Who is there to love? He didn't become love until he made someone to love? That doesn't make sense. That's not what scripture teaches. It's just part of his nature. He's love. How about question number five? How can Jesus be God if he's God's son? Ah, because Jesus, he's the person, the son, but he's the being, God. And there's a difference between person and being. So the son refers to his person. The fact that he's God refers to his being. So literally, you can answer this question, how can Jesus be God if he's God's son? The answer is the Trinity. That's the only way. That's the way he can be God and the son of God is through the doctrine of the Trinity. That's how it makes sense. We're forced to believe it. Question number six is, but Colossians, Colossians says that Jesus is the first creation of God. Colossians 1.15, he's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Actually, it doesn't say he's the first creation, does it? It says he's the what? The firstborn over all creation. And that term firstborn doesn't mean first one born. Just like jumbo shrimp doesn't mean really giant little. Right? Words don't always mean what the root word of the word means. It means what it, how it's used in context. That's how we get the meaning of words. Psalm 89, 27, God uses the term firstborn, referring to um, the, the son of David, the descendant of David, and says, I will also make him my firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. So in this case, the firstborn here just means he's going to rule over the other kings. So firstborn here didn't have anything to do with lineage. It just had to do with being chosen and exalted above the other kings. Firstborn. He gets the, 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 uh, the, the rulership, the authority. In Exodus 4.22, God says to tell Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. Oh, Jesus is, Israel is the firstborn among the nations. He's the nation God chose for a special purpose. So Jesus, he's the firstborn, not part of God's creation, but firstborn over all creation meaning he's in charge. He's the boss. That's all it's saying. He is the boss. And this is what it means in context. If you would turn to Colossians 1, we're almost done. We got one more question after this. Colossians 1, verse 15, this is the verse they take you to, and all you have to do is keep reading. And I'll show you why, why this, this verse shouldn't stumble you anyways. Colossians 1, 15 says, he is the image of the invisible God. First off, he's God's very image, He's, he's what you can see of the, of, God's, of the invisible God. Okay, that's declaring his deity. He's the firstborn over all creation. That just means that he's in charge over all creation, not part of creation. And then to make it more clear, verse 16, for by him, by Jesus, all things were created. Everything was made by him. So he's not part of creation. He's the creator. That are in heaven, that are on the earth, that are visible, invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And he's before all things, and in him all things consist, and he's the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that, that in all things he may have the preeminence. That's what it means by firstborn, preeminence. It says he's the firstborn of the dead. Well, you weren't even born from death. It's rather, he is the, the one through which we all have life, and of those who have eternal life, he's our king. He is the pre, he's the preeminent one. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell. So we have the doctrine of the Trinity securely taught in Scripture, even in the passages people want to use to, uh, to refute it. This is why in the New World Translation, the Watchtower's version, they add the word other several times in Colossians. So they say he's the firstborn over all other things. Or he's the, excuse me, all, things were, all other things were created through him. That's the phrase. All other things were created through him. But there's no justification for adding the word other, which is why nobody else does. Pick a translation. Um, yes. 
So last question, why didn't Jesus say, I am God? How would you answer that one? He did, man. John 8, 58. Who do we appreciate? <laughs> Jesus. He did. He, said, he, he, he proclaimed it, and it was so clear they were going to try to stone him because it was either the most, the most glorious truth of reality or he was blaspheming. It was one or the other. You've got to accept him as king and God and creator of all things, or you have to call him a blasphemer. One or the other. Trusting God means believing in the Trinity, I think. Um, and the final like problem someone might have, maybe even here in the room tonight or today, it's not night yet. It feels like night. It's January. It's Jan- all January feels like nighttime. <laughs> the, <laughs> amen. <laughs> The final thing some people say is they get all these scriptures, they hear all the truth of the Bible, and then they just go, well, I just don't get the Trinity. And I just want to ask you to slow down if that's you. If you're like, I see that the Bible teaches it, but I just don't accept it because I don't get it. All you're doing is you're thinking yourself wiser than God. Like God tells you, this is who I am. And you go, I hear you saying who you are, God, but I'm not so sure about that. You don't have to fully get the doctrine of the Trinity. You have to believe it. I don't understand exactly how the brakes in my car work. Right? Like, I get the pads on the wheels. I get that part. But I don't understand all of it. Right? I don't get the anti-lock system and things like that. I don't understand all that stuff. But you know what I do? I believe that it works. And I don't look at the brakes in my car and be like, I'm not getting in that car. Why aren't you getting in your car, Mike? Well, I mean, I, I've heard that the brakes work, and I understand, and I've been told that they work and all that, but I just don't get it so I refuse to trust it. I don't live any of my life like this. Why would I do this with God? When God says, this is who I am, you believe him, it's very simple. It's very simple. And that's, that's the doctrine of the Trinity. And um, I would say this, if you do feel like you want to know it better, two things you can do is, one is study it more, learn better the doctrine of the Trinity. Another thing is to know this, that according to scripture, we're going to know God better in eternity than we do now. So much better. In fact, it describes our current knowledge like looking through a glass dimly or like this sort of foggy view. Like I have this limited understanding of God. But it says in 1 Corinthians 13, 12, for now we see dimly in a mirror, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. I'll know God like he knows me. Because what God has brought you into in Christ is a relationship with God that is eternal and that only gets deeper and stronger that you might experience the love of God that that has happened for all eternity. He's inviting you into that as well. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness, for sending your Son and the Holy Spirit. May we learn to know you better. May uh, May we better understand who you are, that the doctrine of the Trinity would be a delightful thing to us because it's not just about the facts that we have to memorize, but it's about the nature of God. We're we're learning who eternal God is, one being, three persons, triunity. This is your revelation to us. You've reached down and you've told us who you are, and we believe it, and we trust it, and we pray this, Lord, let us take the message of who Christ is that God came and took on our sins. Let us take that message, we pray, and bring it to the people around us, to our communities, to our friends and family, Lord. We pray for a revival in evangelism and for courage in our own hearts in preaching the truth of Christ in a, in a culture that doesn't, often doesn't want to hear it, where we just feel uncomfortable or, or awkward and don't know how to bring it up. We just pray, God, let this be a year of evangelism for each of us individually. A year where we, where we believe that The preaching of the gospel makes a difference in people's lives and that these things are worth talking about, even arguing about in a godly way. Um, We pray for courage, we pray for zeal, and we ask that this year would be live for your glory in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's all stand.